I'm Diana Axelson in Reference Content Development at SAGE. And the book I've chosen to talk about is Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. It's a beautifully written novel that displays the quest for self-identity and self-worth on the part of Janie Crawford, who is the, the heroine. She's an African-American teenager uh, at the beginning of the story in, in Florida. And it, she comes back uh, after, after 40 years to um, return to the town and she tells, us, tells the story of her life to a friend. And she's quite, she, her life is quite amazing. She eventually survives uh, three marriages and, and the deaths of, of um, two of those husbands. And throughout her life, she's struggling against the sexism uh, of her time period and also the, the um, racism and classism of that period. But what's remarkable about the book is it's, it's magnificent on several different levels. On the one hand, it is the story of, of Janie developing through time but it's also the story of how race and class and gender have influenced and structured her relationships um, and those in, in the community around her. Um, it's, there are passages that are, are beautiful, there are passages that are painful, uh, and it's, it's amazing to think of uh, Hurston writing this novel um, in seven weeks, um, publishing it in 1937 never really having it uh, appreciated in her lifetime, um, but Alice Walker and other black women writers thankfully have called it to her attention. Um, one of the key images in the novel is that of a pear tree, and, and that's part of the sensuality and explicit sexuality for which the book was actually challenged. Um, that seems like a, a, a bizarre challenge, um, but I'll read some of the passages that, that point to that. Uh, this first one is uh, Janie at 16. It was a spring afternoon in West Florida. Janie had spent most of the day under a blossoming pear tree in the backyard. She had been spending every minute that she could steal from her chores under that tree for the last three days. That was to say, ever since the first tiny bloom had opened, it had called, called her to come and gaze on a mystery, from barren brown stems to glistening leaf buds, from the leaf buds to snowy virginity of bloom. It stirred her tremendously. How? Why? It was like a flute song forgotten in another existence and remembered again. What? How? Why? This singing she heard that had nothing to do with her ears. The rose of the world was breathing out smell. It followed her through all her waking moments and caressed her in her sleep. It connected itself with other vaguely felt matters that had struck her outside observation and buried themselves in her flesh. Now they emerged and quested about her consciousness. She was stretched on her back beneath the pear tree, soaking in the alto chant of the visiting bees, the gold of the sun, and the panting breath of the breeze, when the inaudible voice of it all came to her. She saw a dust-bearing bee sink into the sanctum of a bloom. The thousand sister calyxes arched to meet the love embrace and the ecstatic shiver of the tree from root to tiniest branch, creaming in every blossom and frothing with delight. So this was a marriage. And then later in the book, um, when she's talking uh, about tea cake, the, the third man with whom she she at last found, finds delight and love. Uh, she, she describes him in this way. All, day in, all next day in the house and store, she thought resisting thoughts about tea cake. She even ridiculed him in her mind and was a little ashamed of the association. But every hour or two, the battle had to be fought all over again. She couldn't make him look just like any other man to her. He looked like the love thoughts of women. He could be a bee to a blossom, a pear tree blossom in the spring. He seemed, to be, he seemed to be crushing scent out of the world with his footsteps, 
crushing aromatic herbs with every step he took. Spices hung about him. He was a glance from God. And then at the very end of the book, we see that while Hurston has graphically portrayed the influence of these cultural forces on Janie, and we've seen her developing psychologically and emotionally, she now speaks about her life with tea cake uh, dead in a way that shows that the book is, is even beyond the, the um, individual and sociological um, framework, but it goes beyond into something that really is a, a worldview or something that shows, shows her in, and her way of thinking of her place in the cosmos. Tea Cake came prancing around her where she was, and the song of the sigh flew out of the window and lit in the top of the pine tree. Tea Cake, with the sun for a shawl. Of course he wasn't dead. He could never be dead until she herself had finished feeling and thinking. The kiss of his memory made pictures of love and light against the wall. Here was peace. She pulled in horizon, her horizon like a great fish net, pulled it from around the waist of the world, and draped it over her shoulder. So much of life in its meshes, she called in her soul to come and see. And that's the end of a marvelous novel.